<clears throat> All right, so thank you everybody for joining. Um, tonight we're going to be exploring the underwater world around the Lahave Islands. Um, so we're going to start just by introducing ourselves, um, a little bit about CPOs, and then I'm going to talk about the project and some of the key findings from our surveys last summer around the Lahave Islands. Um, and then Hunter's really going to dive into the intertidal life um, and the things that we know that sort of live in the intertidal zone. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about steps for next year. Um, and then we've got a brief video to play that sort of summarizes our field work. So I'll play that and then we should have um, plenty of time at the end for any questions as well. So just want to acknowledge that the Lahave Islands um, lie within the district of Kispukwik within Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. And the Mi'kmaq have and continue to be um, stewards of this land and really leaders in conservation. So, so I can start. Um, my name is Rianne Harvey, and I've been with Seaports Nova Scotia for the past um, three years, working as a conservation campaigner. Um, my background is in geography and marine management. Um, and in this role, I've been advocating for marine and coastal protected areas around Nova Scotia. Um, and I love ocean things anyway. Um, I surf a lot and love to get out um, snorkeling and scuba diving when I can. So Hunter, I'll hand over to you. Cool, thank you, Rianne. Uh, yeah, so I'm Hunter Stevens. Um, I'm actually originally from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan and sort of beat the odds and became a marine biologist. Uh, so I moved to Halifax in 2019 and I've been working with CPAWS Nova Scotia for since this past November in an official capacity, but I've done a little bit of field work with them uh, prior to that. Uh, so my job with CPAWS is essentially uh, whenever there's an area that we're interested in maybe getting protected, if there's a body of water, uh, I get sent into it. So I do the snorkeling and record what we see, uh, all the marine life and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's also a lot of what I do in my spare time. I do a lot of scuba diving and uh, snorkeling around Nova Scotia. So um, yeah, we had a blast in the La Haye Islands and I'm really stoked to uh, talk to you all about some of the life we saw. Yeah, so Seapores Nova Scotia is, um, well, Seapores is a national nonprofit organization. We've been around for over 50 years, and there are 13 chapters across Canada, and each chapter sort of operates on its own. So the Nova Scotia chapter is just like sort of a small team focused in Nova Scotia. Um, and our focus is to try and keep Nova Scotia's public lands and waters um, wild and protected. Um, so we've been... Um, involved in the establishment of over 150 protected areas around Nova Scotia. So onto the Lahey Violets. Um, I guess like all of you here are probably aware just how special this area is. Um, and we know it's been identified as an ecologically significant area by several researchers and by the government, by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, there's a variety of pristine coastal ecosystems. So we've got sandy beaches, um, rocky headland, eelgrass beds, kelp beds, um, salt marshes. But despite there being a fair bit of local knowledge about these islands, um, there really isn't a lot of public um, information on species presence, absence, and distributions. Um, so this is really sort of like the starting point for, for our project here. And just to note, all of the photos that we're sharing in this PowerPoint, we took on our surveys. Um, so this is a drone shot of Cape Lahave Island um, from Seal Point looking northwards. So we last year, we started this two-year project um, around the Lahave Islands which is really sort of CEPOs leading um, groups of different organizations or individuals um, to conduct these um, coastal surveys to try and increase the baseline ecological um, data that's available around the islands. And then this can sort of inform future um, conservation work. And oh, I guess I should just, this and this photo is from, this is us in the water at Bantam Bay Beach. 
Okay, so we wanted um, these surveys to be as sort of low impact as possible, and we partnered with Cape Lahave Adventures. Unfortunately, they weren't able to join us this evening, um, but Cape Lahave Adventures, especially Gavin, was really instrumental in making these surveys happen. Um, because of their local knowledge, we're able to figure out which sites we could visit um, and really sort of like sample a variety of different areas around the islands. So we um, went out for some scoping surveys in July and then we came back in September. And I think it was just over two weeks um, total that we were out um, surveying the different sites. And this photo is um, Magic Beach on Middle Island. And you can see the team in the water. So in total, we were able to survey 12 sites um, around the islands. Um, they're all marked here on the map. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to get sort of to the um, northeast section of Cape Lahave Island. We were hoping to get a few more sites around this side, but because of the weather conditions, it just wasn't possible on this trip. Um, and I say weather conditions, but in particular, Hurricane Fiona um, cut short our surveys by a few days. Um, so yeah, that was that's why there's a little sort of like gap on that side. But despite that, we still managed to survey like a fair number of sites and get sort of like a diversity of some of the ecosystems around the islands. So um, I mentioned Cape Lahave Adventures sort of making it all possible. We actually surveyed almost all of the sites by kayak. So Gavin guided the group of us to these sites. Um, we carried all of our gear with us. Um, and then we did the sur surveys, we packed up and we tried to do two sites most days. Um, and we had an amazing team of volunteers as well that helped make it possible. So um, Sarah Van der Kaden, Alana Caravan, Monica Neufeld, um, were just three of the volunteers that helped us out with some of the surveys. And I don't know, um, Hunter, if you wanted to touch on the gear just quickly. Yeah, for sure. I just I just want to highlight like the logistics with this because uh, on paper, it sounds really nice that uh, we get to do this and it is really nice. You know, we get to go to uh, these really pristine areas and go all over and go snorkeling and go swimming. But uh, this is Atlantic Canada. Uh, the water is not warm. Uh, so even in the summertime when we're doing this, uh, you have to be wearing pretty thick wetsuits. Uh, we're, you know, usually at least in five millimeters of neoprene. And you can see uh, I'm in the top left picture there and Rianne's in the bottom right. But you can see that we're wearing gloves, boots, hood. We've got everything on there. And we're doing a couple of these each day, too. Uh, so, you, you know, you, it's pretty cold. And for those of you that have put on a wet wetsuit, uh, you know that it's probably one of the worst feelings in the world. Like, it sucks. Uh, so it, it, you combine that with like rain and wind and stuff like that. And sometimes it can be a little bit unpleasant, uh, but it's always worth going into the water. And that's what we're going to highlight today. Uh, but, you know, taking all of this stuff in a kayak uh, is pretty challenging. And again, just a shout out to Cape Lahave Adventures and especially Gavin, just a really amazing guy, always willing to make stuff work. Uh, but one of the things about wearing all this neoprene is that you become totally buoyant. You have to like force yourself underwater. So that's why you can actually see in this top picture here, uh, I'm wearing a weight belt and I'm a bit of a wuss. I wear a lot of neoprene in the water because I get cold fast. So I'm wearing about 20 pounds of lead in that picture. So that's 20 pounds of lead that we got to load into a kayak or, uh, you know, elsewise and spread that amongst ourselves. So it's uh, it's challenging work. We there's a lot of planning that goes into it, and uh, this year really paid off, as you'll see. Yeah. So for most of the sites, um, we um, we would do like a snorkel survey, and then we would assess the coastal ecosystem using um, where, where possible a drone, um, but also just sort of like on foot. Um, and so in the water, we would do the roving diver technique. So we'd have minimum of two people on the water and one person on land as land supports. So watching, keeping the um, snorkelers like in line of sight at all times. Um, and the two um, divers would then just sort of record all of the species um, that they saw in the area and they would note down um, their abundance. So a singular um, like creature, um, a few, which would be between two and 10, many, which would be between 10 and 100, or abundant, which is over 100. 
Um, and as well as um, sort of the snorkel surveys, we were able to do um, sort of a few collaborations um, with um, Dalhousie. So um, we had an honor student from um, the Anima Taxis Lab come out with us and she used a drop camera from the kayaks to record uh, kelp presence and absence on the west side of Cape Lahave Island. Um, so that sort of feed into a bigger project around Nova Scotia. Um, and then we also worked with Dr. Christina Border from the Future of Marine Ecosystems Lab at Dalhousie. Um, and this is actually, you can see them on the boat in this photo. And they were taking um, sediment cores in the eelgrass um, as part of their broader project. Uh, but they also sort of um, guided us with a methodology, like a transect methodology for the eelgrass. Um, so we used that at two of the sites um, on Middle Island and at Turner's Point, which is pictured here, where we would put down a 100 meter transect and using quadrats on the transect, we would um, measure a few different variables on the eelgrass. So number of shoots, shoot length, um, et cetera. Um, so we have this information for these sites and this can be used in comparison now um, against different sites around Nova Scotia and just is sort of all feeding into um, bigger projects that are helping to look at the health of eelgrass beds around Nova Scotia. And um, I particularly love this photo because all of the sort of dark area you see underwater, this is all eelgrass. Um, so you really get a sense of how much eelgrass there is um, between Turner Point and then um, the island sort of like across the channel here. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the sort of key findings or sort of conservation features from our surveys. Um, so we we're able to get out to Bantam Bay Beach, which um, you, some of you are probably where is sort of um, this huge, beautiful sandy beach on the far side of Cape Lahave Island. So it's only accessible by boat. Um, and it's hands down one of the best beaches in Nova Scotia. It's absolutely amazing. But um, we were really surprised um, by the diversity of marine life um, that we saw at this site. Um, it, we really weren't expecting it considering it's sort of like a sandy beach ecosystem. So we surveyed along the west side of the beach, along the sort of rock outcrop, um, and there was a diversity of um, algae, but also invertebrates. And the waters were really clear, so this really helped with our survey. And I, I think this next photo, yeah, these were taken from Bantambi Beach. So we've got Gavin and Monica in the water, and the, you can just see how clear the water is. Um, Gavin's got a Jonah crab there as well. And so these photos were from the survey. We've got um, a Jonah, some Jonah crab on the right here. Um, and Hunter's probably going to mention this a little bit later on, but um, we saw a fair number of Jonah crab and they outnumbered the invasive green crab species, which is really unusual in Nova Scotia. So that was a, a really um, great thing to see. We also saw a diversity of coralline algae, that's the bottom left photo, um, which, uh, yeah, was quite remarkable. Um, and not in the water, but on the beach, um, this photo, we've got some semi-palmated um, plovers. And um, we know this beach is a really important area for migratory shorebirds. And so that's really something we're hoping to look into a bit more in the future is get sort of a bird expert out here um, to really identify some of the species. So in these photos, um, we're looking at Irish moss. Um, so at Bantam Bay Beach, but also at some of the sites on the west side of Cape Lahave Island, we saw these really dense beds of Irish moss. Um, and now Irish moss, because of its sort of commercial importance, has been pretty heavily harvested around Nova Scotia, especially in the south shore of Nova Scotia so to see these sort of like dense healthy beds is like pretty remarkable and it's a really excellent representation of this habitat type and very photogenic so I guess a, a, another sort of species of note would be the eelgrass so um we, we, we saw eelgrass at multiple locations um at the more sheltered sites, so typically sort of between the islands, um, eelgrass requires 
protection from wave action, but a strong current. Um, so sort of these channels are really like the perfect locations. Um, and a lot of these beds appear to be in like very good health. And we saw like um, a, a range of other species um, sort of living within them. And we know eelgrass is like an, is in a very important um, species for its um, nursery habitat for juvenile fish and invertebrates. Um, but it also provides um, coastal protection by um, reducing sort of wave action and filtering water. Um, and it's also a, a source of blue carbon, which means that it um, captures and stores carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So um, it's a very important species. It's being looked at around Nova Scotia. And so sort of identifying these healthy beds was um, one of the sort of key findings from our surveys. All right, and with that, I think I'll hand over to Hunter and we can dive into some of the things we saw. Cool, thanks a lot, Rianne. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Rianne has kind of touched on some of the highlights for this, uh, this trip, and uh, especially with the eelgrass, uh, one of the other reasons that we're really interested in that is that actually a couple decades ago, eelgrass uh, just about went extinct here on the eastern seaboard. It was something like 98% wiped out. Uh, and that was uh, due to a slime mold pathogen. And so it's only been in the uh, recent sort of decades that it's actually started to make a comeback. Uh, and this was a big critical part of the uh, intertidal ecosystems here, because as Rianne said, uh, it's very important fish habitat and shelter and uh, a whole bunch of other ecosystem services that it provides us with. So uh, working with those other labs on the eelgrass projects is really rewarding and uh, it, sort of helps us to uh, shift how we're looking at these patches of uh, eelgrass and their own little ecosystems. Uh, but starting off here, we've got a couple of the fish species that we see quite often. Uh, on the left is a school of sand lamps, and uh, they're so called because they've got this really interesting habit of uh, escaping predators by diving straight down into the sand. So uh, when we're swimming, if we startle these schools, they like to sort of hang out in the shallows. They'll actually just dive face first into the sand and they'll completely disappear. Uh, and if you sit there and you watch, you'll see them wriggle in the sand and you might see one poke their heads up, but they're pretty good at spotting you. Uh, and it's a lot of fun to watch the other fish chase them. Uh, sometimes we'll see pollock and we got some pictures of those as well, chase these things with their mouths wide open. And then they try to follow the school into the sand and then they just sort of ram into the bottom of the uh, ocean floor at full speed and look sort of dazed and confused afterwards. Uh, so they're really pretty. It's really fun to see a couple hundred of these uh, fellows swimming around you. And if you're really, really still, they'll kind of get used to your presence. And I've had them just swimming right in front of my face and all you can see is sand lines. It's lovely. Uh, on the right hand side here, we've got winter flounder, which are probably the most common flatfish species uh, that we see here on the South Shore. Uh, so these are a lot of fun too, because they're, you know, a little bit uh, cocky, I find underwater, uh, you know, you might you might be making some noise or stirring up some sand. And they sort of take it as an invitation to come check out what all the commotion is about. So they'll actually sort of swim towards you and you'll see them, they'll kind of come up off the bottom and then swim and stop. And you'll just see their eyes like rotating on either side of their head, trying to pick you out and figure out what you're doing. And they'll come sit right next to you and they're just waiting for you to stir up that sand more. And they want to pick out all the little shrimp and stuff that gets uh, stirred up. Um, but as you can see, they're also really cryptic. They like to blend into the bottom. So that means that when you're getting close to them and you're approaching them, they're just sort of, you know, sitting there hoping that you don't actually see them, that you, you don't, you can't actually picture where the fish is and they'll let you get really, really, really close before uh, they'll take off and run off on you. Uh, so we saw quite a few of these and we saw a lot of different age classes as well, which is really good for us because it's indicative that the uh, population there is reproducing if we see juveniles and adults. Uh, if we only saw adults, that might be a little bit of a problem because uh, we don't know if they are reproducing or not. Um, so next slide here, Rianne. <clears throat> Uh, continuing on with the fish, uh, on the left-hand side, we've got one of the one of my favorite residents of eelgrass, personally, and that is the northern pipe fish. So it's right there, dead center in the photograph, going right across. Uh, this is Nova Scotia and Atlantic Canada's answer to a seahorse. So it's uh, actually a seahorse cousin, 
And as you can sort of tell in this picture, they look a lot like eelgrass and they are pretty tri tricky to spot. Um, so we actually don't think these fish are altogether that uncommon. They're just really, really difficult to pick out when you're in the water. So uh, we lucked out on one of these days and we actually saw a couple of them in one survey uh, swimming around and they were just sort of doing exactly what you see this one doing. It was very slowly snaking its way along the bottom and sort of moving with the wave action. Uh, trying to mimic all the dead eelgrass around it uh, as it was moving. So they're a lot of fun. They're very cool. Uh, on the right was an interesting little fish. It's, it's a hake of some sort. And uh, hake, you uh, can sort of pick out in the bottom right picture there. There's sort of a white line uh, projecting out from the fish's body. That's actually that fish's pelvic fin. So on a person, that's like if your hips were sort of like moved up to like right below your shoulders. And uh, so those fish actually just sit there and they sort of swim around slowly and they're sort of almost walking around with those little pelvic fins and they're poking and feeling around for stuff moving uh, underneath. Uh, you usually see them more on night dives. They, I find that they're a little bit uh, nocturnal and during the day you can sort of sometimes see them hanging out underneath things and peering out at you. Uh, they also just like dark sites as well. But uh, these ones are interesting because they don't usually come in this silvery blue color. Most of the ones that I've seen are red or ruddy brown. Uh, so this was interesting. Um, and I haven't found a conclusive answer for it yet, but I'm just assuming that this is a younger one. Uh, next slide, Rian. <clears throat> All right, so here I mentioned the Pollock. Uh, so that, that's what we got on the left-hand side there. And these are probably the most common, like bigger fish that we see. Uh, they like to form schools. Um, they're pretty social. Uh, a lot of times you even just see two or a pair swimming around, but you can see some pretty big school of these. And they like uh, the areas that sort of have larger drop-offs. Um, so we saw, we saw a lot of these on the west side of uh, Cape Lahave Island where it sort of faces open ocean drops off a lot and uh, one of the things about Pollock too and their schooling is that other fish love to join the schools as well they like to sort of blend in for shelter so on the right hand side this fish in the center is a fish called a cigar minnow and uh, this observation us seeing it is actually the northern most uh, recorded observation for this species so that was some uh, interesting data that we got out of there and uh, it's a lot of fun when you're doing this you're in the water and you're looking at this school of fish and then all of a sudden you sort of do a double take and you're like, wait, that one, that one doesn't belong. And that happens every so often. Um, and this, this snorkel too, this one jumps out in my memory because we saw a really nice big uh, school of mackerel as well. Um, and the mackerel, what they do when they're feeding is they just sort of form the bait ball and they'll sit there with their mouths and they just open and close them. And you can see like right down their throat and it's it's very interesting so uh those drop-offs were very interesting too um but the deeper water is always a little bit interesting when you're uh, snorkeling as well uh next slide please <clears throat> yeah so this is that site actually so this is the west side of uh cape lahave island and where we were taking those pictures of that pollock was actually on the left hand side sort of close to where that red kayak is right there uh, so this is a really interesting geological feature called a tombolo. Uh, so at high tide, this uh, rocky bit in the open ocean is actually uh, an island. It turns into an island, but here at mid to low tide, you can see we've actually landed our kayaks in the middle of that gravel bar. And then we snorkeled right underneath there. And you can see these dark green patches of eelgrass and just swam out and around and went out to the sort of open ocean side and uh, all the way back around. But you can see even just from this aerial photograph, we've got these big patches of eelgrass, all this uh, algal diversity. Uh, this is nice and sheltered from wave action as well. So we saw a couple of uh, species here that you usually don't see on these really wave exposed shores. Uh, this, was this was probably my favorite site uh, when we were out there. It was just very cool, uh, nice little spot to uh, spend a couple hours and go for a swim. And we got a lot of really good data out of it. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this was another one of our highlights. Uh, it's not actually all that often that we see a fish that has me completely stumped, but this one did. Because, uh, you know, there's a handful of usual suspects when you see a fish that sort of looks like a snake or an eel. Uh, one of them being, you know, an eel. Uh, and the other one, uh, there's rock gunnel and wolf uh, fish as well that we have here in Atlantic Canada. But looking at this, uh, when I saw this, it actually was not a wolf fish. 
And after some digging, we found out that this is a fish called a rye mouth. And we were very, very blessed to see this actually, because apparently they spend like 99% of their lives buried uh, in sand and just sort of in burrows. It's actually really, really rare to see one outside of its burrow. They almost never come out. So why this one did, not sure. Uh, but we lucked out and this was actually a valuable data point as well because we have some uh, contacts over with the uh, fisheries and oceans and they said that they picked up the species on some environmental DNA monitoring but this like seeing it this physical observation is some ground truthing it's real proof that this species is present in the area and is using that habitat. Uh, and it was pretty cool to find it and Rianne was the one that did so I'm going to let her tell that story. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Hunter. So, um, I, yeah, I guess I just also wanted to mention, um, I sort of earlier sort of brought up the sort of we're, we're surveying like a variety of sort of different sites. So you can sort of see through our findings just how varied these sites are. We go from sort of like the west coast um, of Cape Lahove Island with the big drop-offs um, to sort of more eelgrass areas. And then um, this site where we saw the rye mouth around Sandal Island, um, was only a sort of a few feet of water, um, sort of like a, a fine sand substrate. Um, and we're finding like sand dollars in the sand, but not a lot else. Um, and then so you could see sort of quite far through the sort of like shallow water. Um, so it was very surprising. I was just snorkeling along, not seeing um, a lot of changes to see this quite large fish sort of loom up um, um, in my view um, and it was very docile like uh, I sort of called the others over and we were all able to sort of spend a bit of time with it and take its photo um, and so it was just like a really um, special moment of sort of reminding you never know what you're going to see on these surveys um, and the the fact that we're sort of just just in the water for a half hour at a time um, we really don't know there's so much more out there um, that we're just not not viewing at the time. So yeah, really lucky to have seen this one. Yeah, Rianne's right. This site was really, really cool. Um, and it's sort of an example that you never know what you're going to see. Uh, like this was literally like four or five feet of water. Um, and you saw a lot of really cool stuff on this one. Uh, razor clams sort of sticking up out of the water. And then as soon as you disturb the water nearby them, it's really cool. You, they just slide right back down into the sand. Uh, you know, these places you don't expect them turn up some of these fantastic jewels uh, that you really don't expect. It's really cool. Uh, yeah, we can move to the next one. <clears throat> okay, yeah, so we're back at Bantam Bay Beach here. And one of the things that jumped out to me there, it's not really necessarily something that we can put in the report, but the water was crystal clear. Uh, you can see in those pictures, like it just casts this really nice blue light on everything. Uh, I believe that's due to the geology. I think it's a mineral called quartzite in our sand that makes the water really blue, but uh, the prevailing wave action and currents and just, you know, being close and away from any source of uh, terrestrial water, I think really made the water here clear for us. And we lucked out that day too. It was uh, not windy. We didn't have like any wave action coming on that side, which I think is really rare for that, uh, that place. But uh, you, and you could tell that this place gets pounded by waves because it had this really interesting geology too. You can sort of see on the right hand side, the waves have sort of carved out these smooth winding like tunnels and uh, indents into this hard granite uh, that I haven't really seen anywhere else. It's like actually very bizarre. You've almost got like, uh, it looks like somebody's taken an ice cream scoop and just sort of come right underneath some of these slabs and taken it out. It's really rounded and smooth. But um, one of the things in addition to the Irish moss that really jumped out at us was in some of these places that sort of had the shade and not as much available sunlight, there was a ton of this stuff called coralline algae. So it's an algae, it's related to like the kelps and stuff like that, uh, but it's not a coral, uh, but it's hard. And so it uses calcium carbonate in the water, which is uh, limestone and the molecule that most animals in the marine environment use to make things like shells and um, you know anything that's hard, like crustaceans make their shells out of calcium carbonate. Uh, a lot of snails will incorporate it. A uh, real corals incorporate calcium carbonate into their uh, structure. So these are the same. And this was just very, very cool because they grow very slowly. They're sort of like underwater lichens. 
And you can see we've got some really thick mats of them here. And uh, one of the th interesting things that I came across while I was reading about these is that they actually promote the settlement of mollusk larvae. So things like snails um, uh, and uh, octopus and stuff. We don't really have octopus up here. So it's mostly the gastropods and bivalves. Um, so the whelks, the winkles, uh, mussels and stuff like that. And that's because these grazing snails will keep the surface clear of uh, algae that otherwise is sort of gonna smother this coralline algae, keep it from photosynthesizing. So uh, it, it forms an important component in the early stages of these animals' lives. And a lot of animals feed on these little snails. So it's very important for them too. Uh, also, just picture yourself as like a microscopic or near microscopic snail and the surface of this coralline algae. It provides a ton of structure and shelter for all these little tiny organisms in the early stages of their lives. So it was really unusual and uh, I think very interesting to see these big thick mats and the extent of it growing here at this site. Yeah, I haven't seen it anywhere else and we didn't see it anywhere else in the La Have Islands chain. It was just at this one part of Bantam Bay Beach. There's, there definitely could be more. That's uh, why we're going to be heading back there and uh, checking more out. But it was just very cool. Uh, next slide, please, Rian. So yeah, just an example of some of the algal diversity that we saw out there um, on the top left. The, we, there's a couple of different sort of rock weeds that we grouped together as fucoids. Uh, so there's fucus serratus, fucus spiralis, fucus ditistius, fucus, fucus vesiculus. Um, and they're all a little bit tricky to tell apart, but um, serratus is the invasive or non-native one. The rest are uh, uh, native species. Uh, on the bottom left is my favorite algae actually. And that's how you know I'm a nerd is because I can finally say that I have a favorite algae and I don't consider myself an algae person. But uh, this one is really cool because it, it's hard to tell in this picture, but you can actually see the individual cells of this algae. They've got really large cells. Uh, when you look at it, it almost looks like a segmented worm of some sort. You can pick out little segments on it, but each one of those little segments is actually a cell of its own. Um, and that one's called Ketomorpha melagonium. Um, I don't think it has a common name. Um, and then uh, just another green algae here. And on the right hand side, uh, another unidentified brown algae um, amongst some of this branching coralline algae that I was just talking about. So you can see it's formed a bit of a thicker mat there. Uh, one of the things that we realized this year is that uh, algal species are just about impossible to identify without a microscope, actually. Uh, there's a lot that you can tell just by looking at algae. Um, and usually you can get down to a tentative sort of identification. But uh, one of the things that's people are really sort of like realizing now is that there's a lot of different algal species that look very, very similar to each other. Uh, so we're trying to brush up on our knowledge on that one, but um, a lot of these algaes, we saw a ton. We saw so many different species, but uh, it just takes a lot of effort to uh, get them identified and uh, some different infrastructure as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we saw a lot of kelp too, and this is a good thing because right now uh, there's a lot of research going on into how kelp species, specifically finger kelp, which you can see here, it's got, it's the ones that uh, when you see it washed up on the beach, it's sort of got like a hand, it's got like an arm, and then it sort of gives off like five ribbons in every direction there, it looks like a fan. So that's called uh, finger kelp laminaria. Uh, so finger kelp is in a rapid decline on uh, the shores of Nova Scotia and on the southern shore. And uh, mm -hmm. there's a couple different causes. Uh, there, people are pointing towards climate change and other and effects related to climate change, including uh, a friendlier environment for this really invasive and nasty animal called an encrusting bryozoan, uh, Membranipera. And on the left hand side here, you can actually see it on the blade of kelp that's sort of on the left there. There's this white upside down V. Yeah, Rianne's tracing it there. So, what this this stuff does is bryozoans are colonial animals. They're really, really tiny. And they form these colonies and they sort of form a mat over the surface of the kelp, the phallus. And it's really nefarious because what this does is two things. It prevents the kelp from releasing its spores and reproducing. And it also takes up an uh, area that would be available for photosynthesis. So 
this kelp wants to photosynthesize and this bryozoan is covering it up. It can't get that sunlight. So it's, uh, it's choking down the kelp and slowing its growth as well. And we usually sort of, we'd rely on cold water to sort of kill this off, this winter die off. But um, if water and winters are getting milder, there's gonna be less dieback. And uh, the consequences of infestation with this bryozoan are gonna get worse and worse. So we did see a good amount of kelp um, here in the Lahave Islands. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it was covered by that invasive bryozoan. But uh, here you can see that these, this kelp actually seemed pretty healthy. There's not uh, huge patches on it. Um, a lot of times you'll actually just see like those big ribbons are just rotted away. It's actually pretty sad. But uh, the kelp is really important for a lot of fish. And you can see here again, the pollock love it. So we'll go to the next slide, please. All right, and now we're moving into our crustaceans. So on the left, we've got Nova Scotia's multi-billion dollar crustacean, uh, our American lobster. They are one of my favorites to see underwater. Um, there's a lot of behavior that you don't see in the grocery store that goes on underwater. These guys are just full of life. They like to run at each other. They'll sit there with their claws up and you'll see them just sort of like staring at each other for a while. And then, you know, in some language that only they know, one of them goes one way, one of them goes the other. But you can really tell it, it looks like they're having conversations. You see them fighting and running at each other and flopping the tail to get away and they're jumping around. Uh, and one of my favorite facts about lobster that I love to share uh, is that they actually can talk to each other um, and using noise. So one of the, th one of the um, interesting things that have come, that's come out of lobster research in the past, uh, I think six years is that they actually vibrate their carapace, the shell that can, that sort of contains all their insides. And it actually makes a really high frequency noise underwater. And so they have different buzzes uh, to communicate with one another. So they've got this auditory communication and this language that we actually don't know about. And we're just sort of starting to uh, look into. So one paper did sort of see that they have an anti-predator buzz. So if something's sort of coming at them, they actually will start like buzzing and make like a distinct tone and hold the claws up and stuff. So they've got some sort of defense with it. But you know, us underwater, we can't hear it. We're pretty blind and deaf and can't smell underwater. So we're out of our element, but uh, it's a different world under there. Uh, top right is uh, one of the rock crabs. Uh, this is another one of Nova Scotia's native crabs. And uh, Rianne mentioned something really cool that we saw in this survey. And this was that at Bantam Bay Beach, these crabs outnumbered the green crabs. And, you know, assuming everybody here is in Nova Scotia, uh, you know how much of an issue green crab are. They are everywhere. Um, they're in all, all any, if the water's salty, uh, there's green crab in it. And they're really, really tough to kill. So it was very interesting and very cool for us to see them uh, outnumbered by our native crabs, which is not something we usually see. And uh, to illustrate how hard they are to kill, like look at this green crab in the bottom right. He's missing uh, its other pinching claw. You can actually see the leg got ripped off there. It's, it looks like it's missing at least one eye. And uh, the carapace uh, has some sort of growth and like rot on it, but it still managed to catch itself a sand lance and is eating it. So they are hardy, nasty little critters. Um, and we did see, you know, a, a good amount here, not more than anywhere else that I've seen in Nova Scotia. Uh, it's just unfortunate that they're present, but it gives me hope that we actually did find a site where they were outnumbered by the native crabs. That's a really good sign. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and moving into some more of our crustaceans. On the left-hand side, we've got the sand shrimp. Uh, these ones are everywhere. If there's sand on the bottom, there's sand shrimp there, but you just would never see them. Uh, so one of the fun things that I did on this trip was I went down to the dock uh, from where we were staying, and I just took the flashlight and I just shone it over the surface, over the uh, silt that was down by the dock. And I just saw hundreds of little pairs of eyes just poking out, looking at me. So these guys like to come out at night and, you know, very cryptic. Uh, but they can actually swim really fast. They look like little underwater UFOs. It's really funny because they'll come up into the water column and you just see the legs moving. And these guys are actually pretty big. They're about that size and they just sort of glide and cruise around. So they're very cool. Uh, they like to follow crabs and lobster around because those will dig and then they get to uh, pick up anything that's left behind. On the top right is a Baltic isopod. 
So these guys are actually related to those roly polies or wood lice that you might find if you like lift up a rock or a cinder block uh, around uh, outside or in the garage, those little flat bugs that run around. Uh, they're not actually bugs, they're crustaceans. So they're more closely related to uh, crabs and lobster than they are grasshoppers. So next time you see those guys, you got a nice crustacean fact. Uh, but these uh, isopods are really fun. They like to cut vegetation and ride around on it in the water column to sort of get moved from place to place because they are small. They can't really swim that well. Uh, this also leads them to wanting to cling to uh, snorkelers in the water. And uh, I've actually had an incident where one of these climbed up my swimming trunks and then fell out of them when we were on the beach. So that was a bit of an eye opener for me. And it's why I now always wear a wetsuit when I go into the water. Um, on the bottom right, we've got uh, another crustacean. Uh, again, just looks like a shrimp. There's so many technical names for technical shrimp. Uh, these are amphipods, and you've probably seen these buzzing around in tide pools. And they sort of act as underwater pollinators. So they uh, like to, they'll buzz around on the eelgrass and different algaes and stuff like that. And they sort of aid in getting the uh, reproductive, uh, uh, the gametes, the reproductive structures from algae to algae and help with that reproduction. And they're also just really important food for a lot of fish. Uh, the juvenile winter flounder, especially uh, like these guys, um, I, they'll snack on them forever. Uh, but yeah, just a really important food source and uh, fulfill a lot of interesting little niche roles in the ecosystem. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, and now more fish on the left-hand side, we've got these winter flounder again, and just highlighting those age classes uh, this was during one of those eelgrass surveys and I just happened to look down and I saw a nice big winter flounder and I looked a little bit closer and I realized that it had a baby winter flounder uh, just sitting right on top of it. So that's probably just chance. Uh, they, I, I haven't seen that sort of behavior before. I think that's actually just very good luck that uh, happened to spot that. Um, and then on the bottom right, uh, this is a fish that sort of highlights the, some of the challenges in this work. So I've been able to identify everything so far, uh, and that comes with a lot of reading and there's got a lot of research that goes into that. Uh, so this fish in the bottom right is a fish that's actually normally found further south uh, towards Florida. It's called the Creval Jack. Uh, and the adult looks, it can grow to be about four feet long or three to four feet long and looks just totally different. Looks very silvery, looks, you know, like a lot more like an open ocean game fish. Uh, and this thing down here is its juvenile form. So a lot of fish look very, very different when they're younger. Um, and so this is just an example of that. Uh, this fish here, the Creval Jack, is going to lose that black stripe. It's going to lose this yellow coloration, and it's going to turn totally silver. So you've got to be able to, it's not just knowing the adult forms of fish. It's also, you know, what could they look like at different points in their life? And uh, that's something that we need to think about when we're doing this field work is what life stages of these animals are we going to encounter if we go into the water? Because that'll differ throughout the season. If we go in early spring and late summer, we'll see the same animals, but they might look different. Uh, next slide, please, Ria. <clears throat> okay, and uh, so back, uh, thinking back to the west side of middle or of uh, Cape Lehave Island, that cool tombolo that I was talking about. Uh, on the left is one of the critters that we found in the bay that uh, requires that shelter from that wave action, and this is a burrowing anemone, a uh, serianthid. Uh, so they are true to their name. They actually will sort of burrow down into the sand or the substrate and you'll only see, you know, this open mouth of theirs. And if you come close or disturb it or anything like that, it's going to shoot right down its burrow. And um, I've tried to collect these for uh, some scientific reasons before, and I have been skunked every single time. I think that they make their burrows something like at least two feet deep. And when you're in there and you're digging underwater and you're throwing sand everywhere and you can't see, it's it's a challenge. And I'm trying to get this thing out of there intact too. I don't want to stab it with the shovel. So, you know, they don't have any, they, ha they don't even really have like nerve cells, but somehow they've outsmarted me. So that's the pinnacle of evolution in my mind. Uh, one of the interesting things about the serianthids up here is that they're a little bit atypical from the species description for the expected uh, species that we find up here. And there's some interesting ones that sort of their tentacles are actually like a ruby red. They're really pretty. It almost looks like they're wine. It's like somebody's filled them up with wine or something. Uh, but 
it looks different from the species description. So I'm still talking to a couple of um, people right now. And this is one of the reasons that I want to sample them and uh, collect some is so that we can send them off for testing and actually figure out like, is this the species that we know is here? Or is this something new that hasn't been described yet? So it's pretty cool that in 2023, uh, we're still sitting here and you know we've seen these animals for years, but we're still figuring things out about them and even still just putting a name to the face. Uh, on the right hand side is uh, one of the biggest and ubiquitous characters of the uh, snorkel surveys and that's the Acadian hermit crab. And uh, they're just always fun to watch. And you, sometimes, it, I don't know what causes it, you'll see hundreds of these things aggregate and they're all kind of just sort of moving across the sand. And as you swim over them, you see them like going in and out of their shells and you can see the disturbance you're sort of causing. And they've got this really nice iridescence on the front claws and this blue in their tissues. And uh, on this trip, I actually witnessed something that I may not ever witness again in my lifetime. And that was one changing its shell. So I actually sort of was looking at one and I saw it was really far out of its shell and I was watching and it kept coming out, going back in. And it was kind of like grabbing this other shell and looking at it. And I sat there for like 10 minutes straight watching this hermit crab. And finally it lifted its butt out of the shell and I saw the hermit crab butt and then it went back into the shell. So I'm, I consider myself lucky to have seen it being one of the few people to see hermit crab, but um, as part of their job description. So uh, that was a highlight for me as well. Uh, next slide, please, Rian. All right, and so that's sort of the conclusion of some of the real big faces that we saw this uh, summer, uh, but we're hoping to do this again uh, next year. So I'm currently planning right now our field season for uh, summer 2023. We're going to be making two trips out there. I think we'll be making one in May and one at the end of August. Uh, because again, the different ecological events, different species are going to be present in the area at different times of the year. So we had a lot of success this year and uh, we're hoping to replicate that and get to some of the other sites that we uh, either got chased out of by bad weather or just couldn't make it to uh, last summer. Uh, so with this being said too, uh, if, you know, if anybody listening is interested um, or you know, can think of somewhere that we should check out or just has any sort of information that you think might be uh, helpful or useful, or if you just want to uh, join us for uh, some of this work and just come out and talk to us, we are planning to have, uh, I think, one day uh, where we'll actually just sort of be snorkeling with the public if people want to like come out and just do a little bit of surveying with us. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about it. Uh, we're still hammering out the date and all that, but uh, that is our plan right now, is that we will be coming back in May and at the end of August. Uh, so yeah, next slide, please, Rian. All right, yeah, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, so that sort of wraps up our presentation. Just wanted to um, end with this artwork um, by the very talented Molly Wells. So she actually... All, all of the creatures you can see um, in this painting were all things that we saw on our surveys. Um, and we have postcard versions of this artwork. So um, we'll be bringing those with us if anyone's interested um, for sort of the snorkel days next summer. Um, yeah. And so I guess before we go to the video, just we just wanted to say like a, a big thank you to Kate Lahave Adventures. Um, they really made all of this work possible. Um, and also to all of the volunteers and the divers that came up and helped us um, and for the um, accommodations, local accommodations that we stayed at. Um, it was really felt like sort of a community effort for these surveys and we're really grateful for it. We think we've got some really good results. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna trans transfer to the video for a second and then we'll go to questions. In the meantime, yeah, I also just want to say, you know, a great big thank you to all of the people that we've talked to down in the Lahave area already. Um, and, you know, the people that have hosted us too when we were staying down there, it's mostly Airbnbs. We've always uh, had great hosts and the community is just always so friendly. Everybody's always asking what we're up to. Um, and, you know, again, to Cape Lahave Adventures, it was just like, those guys rock. Uh, if you're going kayaking down in Lahave, if this all looks interesting to you and you're like, hey, I got to do that. Uh, you can't go wrong with talking to the people at Cape Lahave Adventures. They were uh, really instrumental to this, like Gavin's local knowledge. Uh, you don't understand how important that is on the day of. Like when we wake up in the morning and, you know, the wind's blowing in one direction, uh, pretty heavy. It's like, okay, cr uh, crap, like where are we going today? 
And Gavin, every morning, was just like, okay, so based on the wave and wind today, I'm thinking that we go here, here, and here. And every day, without fail, you got us in the water. It was fantastic. Yeah. Oh, all right, Hunter, just let me, let's just confirm the sound's working. Sure. No, I am not hearing that. No, okay. Let me try again. Here at the Nova Scotia Chamber Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, and we're really excited to have spent the summer exploring the Lahaid Islands. We've seen some really cool things, and we're excited to share our findings with you all. It's a really special place on Nova Scotia's South Shore. 